Good morning and welcome to Integrity Church. Let's get started. Good morning, my name is Heather and I wanna welcome you to Integrity Church. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Sunday morning service. I want to encourage each and every one of you that even though we are worshiping in our own homes today, we have the opportunity to corporately worship together and lift our voices to the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's join our worship team as they lead us in a time of worship.
Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yes, it's who you are. We make miracle work, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Come on, sing, even when I don't see it. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working.
Hey, we're going to continue worshiping the Lord in our giving this morning and uh, thanking God for his goodness and faithfulness and his provision to us. And as Christians, we recognize that God is the giver of those things. And, and uh, out of obedience, we, we bring our tithes and our offerings to the storehouse. And um, we recognize that God is uh, the owner of all those things by doing that. And so will you pray with me as we continue to uh, worship the Lord in our giving? Father, thank you. Um, for your provision. Thank you for the many ways in which you have uh, met our needs, those times that we knew about it, as well as those times we didn't know about it. And so, Father, uh, we bring our tithes and our offerings. We ask, Lord, that you would bless it and that, Lord, you'd use it to uh, further the kingdom of God um, for the glory of God. Uh, In Christ's name we pray. Uh, Thank you so much for your faithful giving to the ministry here at Integrity. Uh, God bless you. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in. We're so glad to be able to uh, dive into the Word of God with you uh, today. You know, as our church prepares to um, focus on our upcoming prayer strategy, I thought it would be good for us to take a time, a moment of pause, and to consider what is perhaps, or most definitely, uh, one of the most profound prayers that we read about in the scriptures. Uh, It's most profound because it's coming from the lips of Jesus. And it's being offered at a very uh, strategic time in Jesus's life and ministry. There has never been lack of, of conversation regarding this prayer from our Lord because it addresses so much and it gives so much great insight into the heart of our Lord, into his, his mission, as well as his continued desire uh, for his disciples that were with him, as well as his desire for you and I today. We're going to break into this up into a few parts over uh, the course of the next couple of weeks. And I'm speaking about what has become known as Jesus's high priestly prayer that we read about in John chapter 17. In Matthew chapter 6, we have the disciples asking Jesus to teach them how to pray. And it's there in Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus offers for us um, an outline uh, to approach the Father. You're very familiar with that uh, in Matthew chapter 6 and verses 9 through 13 where Jesus says, pray like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but but deliver us from evil. Jesus is laying out a strategy for prayer, an outline for his disciples. Perhaps in the days ahead, I'll address that as we're going through the focus of prayer together. But But what we have in John 17 isn't an instruction on how to pray, but we have an opportunity to to listen in on this most intimate time between Jesus and his father. And it's taking place at a very strategic time in the life of Jesus and in his ministry. One of the things that I love about the scriptures is is it invites us to take a seat at the front row of the most intimate of conversations between Jesus and the Father. It's a strategic time because it takes place during Passion Week, just prior to the events that would lead to Jesus's betrayal by Judas, Jesus's arrest, his crucifixion and his resurrection. I've had some full weeks in the past, but nothing like the week that Jesus went through leading up to his resurrection. Well, this prayer that Jesus offers to his fathers happens right prior to what we know as Passion Week. It is the longest recorded prayer that we have coming from Jesus. And It takes up all of chapter 17. But what we will see that Jesus will address in this prayer is the plan of God for his people, past, present, and future. 
And as we see the faithfulness of God on display from the past and Jesus is present when he prayed for his disciples, it gives us great confidence and, and great hope that we know that Jesus, who prayed for the future church, which is for you and for me, we can see how Jesus was faithful in the past and we can draw from that and draw great hope for the future. This prayer is immensely profound. It was Martin Luther who said that this prayer is truly beyond measure, a warm and a hearty prayer, he says. He opens, speaking of Jesus, Luther says he opens the depths of his heart, both in reference to us and to his father, and he pours them all out. Luther concludes about this prayer that it sounds so honest, so simple, it is so deep and so rich and so wide, no one, can really fathom it, Luther says. The late James Montgomery Boyce, in speaking of this prayer, says this prayer should be to us something of what the burning bush was to Moses. For here we hear God speaking and we should put off our shoes and bow humbly, being about to tread upon the most hallowed ground. I love that. Many have concluded that John 17 is the holy of holies in the gospel account. As we look at this passage of scripture, this chapter in John's gospel, chapter 17, we see there's an outline. We see in verses one through five, Jesus prays for himself. We'll look at that today. Then he see, we see that in six through 19, Jesus prays for his disciples that were with him and then we conclude that chapter looking at verses 20 through 26 as we see Jesus prays for the church. That's you and me today. And so today we're going to focus on the first section and we're going to pay special attention to seeing how Jesus prays that, and, and it will see that it gives us tremendous insight into the nature of Christ, into the eternality of our Lord and into the heart of this one that we love so much. John chapter one and verses one through five, let's take a look at that together. And it says that when he had spoken these things, now let, let's just stop there for one moment. When Jesus had spoken these things, uh, anytime you come to a chapter or the beginning of a chapter and it kind of opens up with this kind of an opening, we, we need to recognize that, that what he's about to say is he's going to create a bridge from, from what he just said to where he's about to go, right? We open this passage up. It says that when Jesus has spoken these things, well, well, what things, right? Never jump forward until you know what those things that this is referring to are making reference to, because that's what helps provide the necessary context, which is essential for Bible reading. And so as we enter into chapter 17, we recognize that there's a bridge from what Jesus had just said in chapter 16 to what Jesus is about to do in chapter 17. So let's go back a little bit in verse chapter 16 and verse 25, and let's see the these things that Jesus said. Let's see what they were. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He said, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, Jesus said, you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I love what Jesus is saying here. He gives us a great highlight. He shows us the heart of the Father towards the disciples. He says, in that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. In other words, I won't need to do that because the Father's heart is open to you. For the Father himself, Jesus says, he loves you. Why? Because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. He said, I came from the Father and I have come into the world. And now Jesus said, I'm leaving the world and I'm going 
back to the father. And his disciples said, ah, now you're speaking plainly. Prior to this, Jesus had spoken sometimes in parables or in ways that they didn't understand, but Jesus is laying very plainly before them his plan to return back to the father. And they said, now you're speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Look what they say. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. And Jesus answers and says, do you, do you now believe? Like it's almost as if Jesus is saying, really, that's what it's going to take? I mean, after all of the miracles, after all of the teaching, after everything you've seen now, this is what it's going to take? Jesus says, do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. I, I think what Jesus was highlighting here is that they, they, they had a lot to grow still in their understanding of who Jesus is and in their understanding of the time in which they found themselves. Jesus says, behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me all alone. Yet, Jesus says, I'm, I'm not alone for the father is with me. I have said these things to you that in me, you may have peace. In the world, Jesus says, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I love this. This provides such valuable context for this prayer that Jesus is about to pray. In verse 33, Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me, you may have peace. Jesus says, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. But listen, take heart. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. We see in this dialogue the, the heart of our great shepherd. We see his care and concern for the sheep, knowing that knowing what his disciples are about to endure, he reminds them that even in the midst of the most difficult of times, times that the disciples, I'm sure, would never even fathom to believe, Jesus is saying in these times that are about to come upon you, they can experience peace even in the midst of that. Why? Because Jesus said, I have overcome the world. You know, what was true for them is true for us as well. In this world, Jesus said, you will have tribulation. We are living in a time where there's so much going on all around us. There's so much chaos. There's so much division. There's so much anger. There's so much hatred in our country. But take heart. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. And you see, it's really important for us as disciples of Jesus Christ that we don't get caught up in everything that's going on around us, that, if, that we fail to recognize that God is at work and Jesus has overcome all of the world. I want you to know that your hope ought not to be tied directly to anything that this world has to offer. My hope is not tied to a particular party or a particular person or a particular vaccine or a particular cure. My hope is tied directly to the Lord Jesus Christ who has overcome the world and will not let anything snatch those who have trusted him out of his hands hand. Take heart, follower of Jesus. Jesus has overcome the world. This is what Jesus just got done saying to his disciples. He gives them a peek behind the curtain for what is about to happen. In this world, Jesus said, it's going to get difficult. It's going to get hard. You will experience tribulation. But take heart, that's not going to be the final chapter. Jesus said, I have overcome the world and therefore because we are his, we too will overcome. 
Now going back into our text of chapter 17, when Jesus had spoken those things, can you appreciate why the context is so important? Now we are linking what Jesus had just said in chapter 16 to what is about to take place here in chapter 17. When Jesus had spoken these things, he, he lifted his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Since you've given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, Jesus is saying, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. What a tremendous opening that we have to this high priestly prayer. Jesus goes from talking to his disciples to now talking to his father. And Jesus says, Father, the, the hour has come. Jesus is recognizing the plan that has been play in place all along. The hour has come suggest that the narrative that has been laid out by the Godhead is going directly according to plan. The hour has come. It suggests a plan, a strategy. You see, Jesus was not the victim of circumstances. Jesus was on mission. He didn't fall at the hand of his enemies, but instead he willingly laid down his life for you and for me. He, he talks about that in John chapter 10 and verse 17. He says, for this reason, the father loves me. Why? Because I laid down my life that I may take it up again. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge, Jesus said, I have received from my father. And so we recognize that even Jesus's death was completely within his own control. He recognized his father, the hour has come. It's important to note that there was never a point in the life of Jesus that he wasn't fully in control of all the circumstances. And recognizing that he came to die as a sacrifice for our sins, he, he acknowledges the reason for which he had come. And he said that reason was upon them. The hour has come. Then he says, glorify the son, father, that the son may glorify you. We see in this statement, Jesus' recognition that he is worthy to receive the same glory as the father. For those who have suggested that Jesus wasn't God, a text like this is really tough to reconcile. John opens up his gospel in John verse chapter one and verse 14. And he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. The glory is the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Father, glorify the son as the son may glorify you. This statement from Jesus in this prayer is not so much a request as much as it is a statement of fact. The Father will glorify the Son, and the Son will glorify the Father. And the way the Son will glorify the Father, we see him saying here, he says, Look, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Think about that for a moment. Think of the things that Jesus willingly endured. Think of the way Jesus willingly allowed himself to be treated like a sheep being led to the slaughter. This same Jesus had the authority over all flesh. 
But his mission was to come and to die, to reverse the curse from the garden, right? To give, a, to give eternal life to all whom the Father had given them. Jesus reverses the curse that took place in the garden. Sin brought death, but Jesus brings life. And Jesus is reiterating what he said earlier on in John chapter six that highlights the unity with which the Father and the Son work together in harmony in the salvation of men. He says here, look, you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And look back at John chapter six and verse 37. Jesus says, look, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise him up at the last day. Jesus is highlighting the fact that it is the Father who elects and appoints salvation and, pre and presents a, to the Son those who are to receive eternal life. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And here is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise him up on the last day. For this is the will of my father, that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. I love this that I will give eternal life to all whom you have given me. And then he defines for us what eternal life is. He says, and this, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The only time in the scriptures that Jesus refers to himself as Jesus Christ, the Messiah. What is eternal life? According to Jesus, it is knowing the one true God and Jesus Christ whom the Father has sent. Eternal life isn't so much a location as it is a restored relationship between creator and creation chosen by the Father and secured by the Son. This is eternal life. I have come that you might have life, Jesus said, and have it more abundantly. John will record those words in John chapter three and verse 36. He that has the Son has life, but he who does not have the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides upon him. Jesus came that we might have life. You may be listening today and wondering what's this thing all about? What's this Christianity thing all about? This Christianity thing is all about us having life in Jesus Christ. It is, not a, it is not a religion that we promote, but it is a relationship, a restored relationship between creation and creator only made possible by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. There is no work you can do. There is no religious activity that you could present, but it is falling before the work of Christ as our only means of salvation. What Jesus did is offer life for each and every one of you. Jesus is stating the mission for which he has come and that mission has been successful. I've given eternal life to those whom you have given to me. Look at verse four. I glorified you on the earth. Look, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. Jesus is saying, I have done everything that was necessary to be done. That's why those last words echoed from the cross. It is finished, have such significance. This is very important because never before has anyone ever accomplished or met the standard of perfection that was necessary to be approved by God. 
Since the time of Adam and Eve, creation has fallen short of what God has required of them. But Christ, the second Adam, he came, he lived a sinless life. He fulfilled all the requirements necessary on our behalf. And then he applied his perfection. He applied his righteousness upon all of those who would embrace his work as their only means of salvation. You see, Jesus is about to pray for his disciples. And then Jesus is about to pray for the church that would come afterwards. And he's highlighting that the means by which you will be accepted by the Father is directly connected to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the earth. I've accomplished everything that you've given me to do. It's not that the Father needed to hear that. It's that you and I needed to hear that. That's why Jesus said those words. He was not informing the Father but he is informing you and I that everything that is necessary so that we might experience forgiveness, that we might experience wholeness, that we might experience life was accomplished through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. That your standing before God is directly linked to Christ's work on the earth. Never will you stand before God on your own merits. No church can bestow enough grace upon you so that we might satisfy the just demands of a holy God. The only means by which we could present to the Father so that we might be accepted is the finished work of Jesus Christ, our only means of salvation. And then to finish out this section Jesus declares his rightful place as the eternal God by saying, and now father glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Think of the ramifications of what Jesus is saying here. Nobody was able to stand in the presence of God like that other than God himself. Glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. The eternal nature of the son of God establishes him over the heavens and the earth, over every timeline, past, present, and future. Before anything existed, Jesus was. John captures this in the opening of his gospel, where he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Another reading of that would suggest that before the beginning began was the word. He, speaking of Jesus, was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, not anything made was made. I love this speaking of Jesus as the creator of all that exists. In him, all things that are held together. And in him, Colossians says, all things exist. In Jesus, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness will not overcome the light. Jesus is in in his prayer, glorify me in your presence with the same glory I had with you before the world existed. What does that mean for you and for me? That this one who is about to pray for his disciples This one who's about to pray for all of those who would come to faith through these disciples, that's you and me. This one who's about to pray for us holds the necessary credentials to accomplish his stated plan and purpose for your life. He and he alone holds the keys to life in his hands. You can rest assured knowing that the one who precedes time as we know it will carry you through every circumstance that you may face. In this world, Jesus said, you will have tribulation, 
but take heart. I've overcome the world. And this one who has overcome the world is able to keep you in the most difficult of times. Whether those times are physical, whether those times are financial, whether those times are spiritual or relational or social, Jesus is able to keep you. I close with this wonderful doxology written by Jude in verse 24 of his epistle. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To our only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen and amen. Hey, Integrity, I am so much looking forward to these next couple of weeks together where we're going to be having a very um, focused time of prayer together. We've been doing this together for uh, the last number of years, and it's just been such a wonderful um, strategy uh, that has brought forth much fruit. Um, but I can't think of a time where I have felt that prayer has been more needed uh, then right now as we're entering into uh, 2021 and coming off of such a very difficult year for so many. Um, and so we are inviting you to join with us for a two week time of prayer and fasting. We're gonna be beginning that on January 17th and concluding um, 14 days after that. Um, I would really encourage you to really seek the Lord and ask God, what is something that you can give up as a fast to the Lord and to use that time uh, to uh, have a heightened sense of prayer and time in the word. And we're excited. We're going to be gathering together on January 17th and uh, looking forward to that time together. Uh, but we also are going to then meet on Monday evenings for those two weeks, both Mondays virtually. Um, and that'll allow us to uh, utilize some of the technology that's available to us. And so we'll have some times of focused prayer, uh, some worship mixed into there uh, and uh, small group times of prayer. And so we're looking forward to that. And then also both on Wednesday uh, of those two weeks, we'll be gathering together here at the church as well. Uh, both of those times will take place at seven o'clock. There's a lot of loud voices um, in our culture right now. And if we're not careful um, to listen to the right voice, um, we can get find ourselves uh, being very misinformed. But the reality is the good news is God's in control. God is over all things and God has a plan and purpose. And so we're going to use these times together just to seek God and to ask the Lord, what would you have us to do in this season for your glory? So join with us. We're looking forward to um, being with you in those times together. God bless you. Welcome back, everybody. I want to thank you, Pastor Tony, for another encouraging sermon this week. And I know that everybody at Integrity Church is grateful for how you consistently point us back to the Word of God and to Jesus Christ. I want to remind everybody that we are planning on restarting our in-person services next week, but please continue to tune into your email for updates. Now for a couple announcements from Connie. Hey everyone, just a quick reminder that Integrity Church will be starting up the, our cohesion groups in the beginning of February. So if you can look out for some emails about that, we'd love for you to get some community and come join us. And just a reminder that if you haven't filled out your Bible reading survey yet, there's still time to do so. So feel free to do that. I hope you're having a wonderful week and that we'll see you soon. God bless. Love you guys. Bye. Thanks, Connie. I just want to remind everyone, if you're not getting any emails from us, it probably means we don't have your contact information. So if you could take a moment to fill out the connect card at the bottom of your screen, then we can help you stay connected on everything that's going on with our church. Have a great week. Bye.